So this will be a, quite an informal session. Um, um, I will include some links. There's four different links to uh, other online information in this presentation. They appear both as a, as a written hyperlink and as a QR code. So if you want to scan those with your phone, um, you're welcome to. And if you want me to repeat them at the end or share the slides, I'm happy to do that. I currently work uh, for the Austrian Academy of Sciences in the Phonogrammarchiv there in Vienna. Uh, before that, I worked at the British Library in their sound archive. And this presentation will draw on my experience of carrying out surveys and working with people carrying out service, surveys at the British Library. So uh, why carry out a survey? What's the purpose of an audio survey? And why, why would I think it a good idea that you get involved in carrying out audio surveys? Well, the, the underlying driving cause or need for this um, is that we have to audio, we have to digitally preserve our sound collections very soon. Uh, there are two good reasons for this. One, most formats of sound carriers are degrading. Uh, the, they are made of multiple types of materials and they degrade in different rates, which cause them to become unplayable. Some are quite stable. Some are already uh, very difficult to play because of their condition. Some are unplayable. But also the technical equipment required to replay them is falling apart or is becoming uh, obsolescent and is no longer produced or maintained or easy to maintain uh, by anyone. So uh, the cost of digitization in real terms is rising. The, the ability to, uh, to replay items is uh, becoming harder and harder. And at some point it will become effectively un unaffordable for me or you or anyone to, to digitally preserve things. So one of the questions is when will that happen? When will it become uh, impossible to replay our sound collections in their original form? Well, it depends on the format, of course, and it depends on how much money you have. Uh, the first time I heard a prediction about how long we had uh, was uh, 16 years ago, and I was told that we might have 20 years left. So by that prediction, we only have four years left. But of course, it, as I say, it depends on the format you have. Um, but the, the purpose then is clear. In, in order to digitize all your sound collections while it is still possible, you have to make a plan, a strategic plan to digitize your collections. And the first part of making a strategic plan is answering the question, well, what do I have? What, what does our institution or what do any institution that we're, we're planning to, to care for, what do they hold in their collections? Uh, so you need to survey what needs to be digitized. So measuring and understanding the challenge that you face is what we're talking about today. And I want to talk about uh, this in two parts, two kinds of survey. First, surveying an individual collection, and it may be the collection that you uh, are looking after. Perhaps it's a, an institutional collection that you work for or a private collection that you have or another institution that you're caring for or want to be involved with. Um, how to survey that individual collection. We'll talk about that in a practical sense. Then perhaps we'll take a short break. And after that, we'll have uh, part two, where we talk about conducting a, a larger survey of multiple institutions. And that could be within a geographical region, or it could be a national survey. And I'll talk about a, a national survey carried out by the British Library. In some ways, it's similar. In some ways, it's quite different. So um, we'll, we'll talk about that in details. And again, I want this to be practical and informal, so do think of questions as we go along and we'll try to address those either uh, after part one or at the end. So carrying out an individual collection survey, and, and I'm going to imagine that this is an, uh, a collection held by an institution or a, a, a company that you work for, but it could be any other uh, kind of uh, situation where it's a single collection you want to or a single uh, responsibility. So as I mentioned, digitization, uh, any form of digitization of audio material requires time and expertise and money. Uh, but how much of each is the big question. Uh, in almost every, I think literally every circumstance I've ever seen, 
it requires more money and time and expertise than you have available. So you will need to ask for more resource. You'll need to find it somehow. And the first part of that is working out uh, a convincing plan for digitizing and working out how much money or resource you need to ask for. So the survey allows you to estimate what is required and to develop a plan. If you already carry out some digitization anyway, um, then one really interesting question you can ask yourself is, if we carry on digitizing at the current rate, when will we finish digitizing everything? Are we already working hard enough? And this is the question the British Library had to ask itself. We already had a digitization set up. We had studios and audio engineers. And we wanted to know if we could just carry on working at the same rate or if we needed to ask for more money. So we had to address that question as we went along. Um, at its most basic, a survey um, is really about uh, identifying the formats that you have and counting them. Uh, so uh, that can be done relatively simply, but it needs to be planned for very carefully. But there's much more information you could gather if you're doing a survey. So for example, uh, you might want to know, make notes about the condition of your collection. Is it all in very good condition? Is it clean? Is it uh, well housed in nice boxes with good metadata? Or uh, is it dusty? Is it moldy? Uh, has it become damp in the past? Uh, does it require new housing, new boxes, for example? You might want to note down information about the contents of the collection to work out whether it's relative to your institution. So one example might be, if you work for an institution that collects oral history, uh, social history material in sound recordings, but you find that you have a large collection of classical music CDs or LPs, well, you have them, but maybe they're not relevant to the, the mandate of your institution. So they're, they're not something that you would prioritize for digitization. Another example might be, do you want to note down something about the ownership of the collections you hold? If they're not owned by you and you do not have the rights to digitize them or you do not have the responsibility for digitizing them, then maybe you need to, uh, that's something that you can factor into your planning. What else might you want to write down? Uh, you might, might want to make notes about the location of the recordings. In some cases, your collection will be held in one place, perhaps in uh, on shelves in, uh, in a nice archival space, or maybe they're held in cardboard boxes, in cupboards, in multiple locations. So it's very common, uh, for example, for a university to have sound recording collections, very small collections sometimes, in multiple locations. Maybe there's a music department, maybe there's a history department, maybe there's a department that collected in speeches that it had recorded uh, at public events at the university. And the, uh, lo writing down the location of everything you find might be really, really important to you. So that's something to bear in mind. And there may be many, many other things you want to make a note of. So how detailed should you be when you're carrying out this survey? How much uh, information should you write down? Well, as a broad principle, the more information you write down, the more useful it might be. But there's one very, very important principle to bear in mind. You need to be able to survey everything to a consistent level. And there's one very important rule that I, in my head, I call it the bridge rule. And that is, uh, if a bridge is only 90% complete, it will not be 90% useful. An incomplete bridge cannot be used for its primary intended purpose. And it's the same with a survey. It's important that everything you want to survey be surveyed at least to a basic level. So if you set out with too ambitious uh, a plan for collecting too much detail and you don't have the time to gather in all that information, um, you will end up with an incomplete bridge uh, and it will not be particularly useful. Another way of thinking about this is to think that knowing everything about something won't help you very much, but knowing something about everything will be more helpful. So. Let's think of some examples. I'll give you some uh, three real world examples. 
um, of surveys that I've been involved in or have heard about to, to give you a sense of, of different ways of thinking about this. In the first example, it's a, a quite a large archive, uh, a medium-sized archive, and it has an awful lot of time and resource. It's a, an archive that is very, uh, very well resourced and they're very good at planning. In this particular archive, they carried out their survey uh, to a very, very high level of detail. I mean, a crazy high level of detail. They took out, uh, they not only did they count all the tapes on the shelf, but they opened every single tape box. They made notes about the content. They, made, they had a micrometer and they measured the thickness of every tape. That's a crazy thing to do, frankly. But if you have the staff and the time, that's really useful because it will help you estimate quite accurately the duration of every tape. They could write down the, the other characteristics. Is it mono, is it stereo, is it a fast tape, a slow tape, and so on. So this allowed them to plan in very, very accurate detail the digitization requirements. The downside, of course, is that it took them a very, very long time to do this survey. And they were lucky they had that time. They were part of a larger institution and that larger institution agreed to allow volunteer staff from other departments work for two hours a week uh, helping out on this survey. So they had lots of helping hands to work on that. That was one example where they had lots of resource and lots of time. Now, my second example is a really, really large archive, but they had almost no time or resource to do a survey. They needed to know really, really quickly uh, something about the whole collection they held. I was involved in this survey and we had three days in which to, uh, to understand the collection as a whole. I was let loose on the collection. I, I uh, began by taking a, literally taking a walk around the archive. I walked down the aisles of this archive and I worked out very quickly, okay, it's quite well organized, but nothing is cataloged. It consists almost entirely of discs, of uh, analog discs, LPs and 78 RPM records, um, and they're all in one place. There's no way that I could count them individually. It was too huge. There's no way that I could uh, look at the individual content in any great detail, at least not for the whole collection. But what I could see was that the collection was quite uniform. The amount of space that the collection took up was about the same all the way through the collection. So what I did was I measured one uh, shelf. A shelf was one meter long and I counted the number of records in that one meter. Then I measured the rest of the archive uh, in terms of meters. And I, worked, I multiplied the number I found on the first meter by the number of meters. In the end, I was able to say, okay, you have 311,000 discs in your collection. That's a huge amount of discs. Um, that's a very basic amount of information, but it was very useful. That collection needed to move and they needed to find a space that was big enough, but also strong enough. This I measured the weight of uh, a, a number of discs and again, extrapolated up. And I worked out that it would weigh more than 60 tons to house this collection. So ordinary book shelving or, or archival shelving would not be good enough. It needed to be much stronger to carry this weight. So this, this information was very useful, but it was a very, very basic survey. It couldn't have been much more basic. The third example I want to talk about is also one I was involved in, and that's the British Library sound uh, collection. This, again, is a very large collection, uh, a massive collection, I would say. We knew quite a lot about some of it, but not about all of it. Uh, and we didn't know enough about the collection as a whole. Uh, luckily, we were able to make an argument within the British Library for some dedicated staff to work on it. We got one member of staff to work on this collection, on counting the collection for one year. Their job was to uh, physically count the different tapes in the different collections to see which collection they involved, uh, that, that each, each uh, tape belonged to and which format everything was in. Uh, this was a big job. Um, in some ways it was made easier because the British Library Sound collections consist of published materials 
and unpublished materials. The published materials were already organized by their format and they were already numbered. So the, uh, for example, the LP collection begins with LP1 and then uh, LP, the, the 1000th LP is numbered LP1000. So simply to count them, all we needed to find out was the highest number on the shelf and that was the number of LPs. That was very quick and very simple. But for the unpublished collections, they were in many different formats, all kept together in, uh, in one space. So they needed to be individually counted. So at the end of it, we were able to say how many uh, collections we had, uh, how many items were in each collection and how many of every format we had in those collections. So the broad results we found. And the survey was done in, in 2014. The British Library, I don't have the exact numbers to hand, I'm afraid, but it was just over 1.6 million physical items in their sound and video collections. That's an awful lot. Uh, they contained, we had to estimate this, we had to estimate how many sound recordings were on each carrier, each item, and we reckoned there's about six and a half million uh, recordings on those in more than 43 different physical formats. I think 43 formats we counted, but how you define a format is slightly, uh, is up for debate really. Is a wax cylinder a single format or would you say that there are multiple formats within the genre of wax cylinder? So about 40 formats. Uh, and then to answer the question that, that we began asking ourselves was, if we carry on digitizing our collections at our current rate, how long will that take? Um, are we, so we did some calculations about how long, how many items we were typically digitizing per year. And then we compared that to what we held and we worked out it would take roughly an, an additional 48 years to digitize everything if we carried on at the current rate we were working at. So the good news was that we were able to carry out that survey. We, we were able to finish it in the way we began hoping to do, and that was quite an achievement. And we, we found the answers that we were, for the questions that we had set ourselves. The bad news was that the answer was something really terrifying. We didn't have uh, enough money, or we didn't have uh, 48 years in which to digitize everything. We understood that we would have, perhaps, if we were lucky, 15 years at that time was our working assumption. So we needed to increase the rate we digitized everything at by about a factor of three. That's pretty hard. You need to find three times more money than you currently have, three times more staff and get support from up above. So that was um, that was a, a very challenging result for us. That was very, uh, very difficult in many ways. But it had an immediate practical value in that it, it told us the scale of the challenge that we faced. So that was a, a good starting point. But it also had another surprising, interesting, uh, positive result that we hadn't really expected, which was the political and the psychological value of finding this information out. So by learning these facts about ourselves, about our own collection, our understanding of who we were changed in a subtle way, but also in a fundamental way. Our, when we turn up for work every morning or when we talk to somebody about what our job is or where we work, our sense of who, what we were talking about had changed. We were able to say, well, we have more than one and a half million items in our collections. That was quite impressive. But it also um, had a really interesting effect on the senior management at the British Library, right up to the highest level, to the chief executive of the British Library. They were able from that moment onwards to simply comprehend what we held, what they held, and therefore what their own responsibility for the collections were. So whenever a chief executive talks to any member of the public or gives a speech or writes a newspaper article, they begin with a very brief survey of what they hold. The British Library is the custodian of da da da, this many books and manuscripts and this many da da da. But they were also able to say from that moment onwards, and also 1.6 million items containing six and a half million recordings. That's really impressive, but it also affected them. They knew that they then had to care for these. And that helped us persuade them to take our challenge, our digitization challenge very seriously. So it helped us to raise some money. Uh, the story of, of how we did that is a longer one for another day, perhaps. But um, 
we created as a result really of this work or as, as a result of the work this is a part of what was called the Save Our Sounds program. This is an eight year program beginning in 2015 and ending this year, 2023. And within that, the Unlocking Our Sound Heritage project, which was a five year project that ended last year to digitize uh, a large part of the British Library collection and other collections outside the British Library around the UK, which I'll, I'll come to when we talk about the, uh, the national survey in a minute. So a practical question for you, I hope you're already asking this in your own head, if you're thinking about doing a survey, how do you decide on the level of detail that you will collect in your survey? How do you come to that decision? It's, I, I mentioned that sometimes it's, you want to gather in lots of detail. Sometimes you might only be able to gather in a tiny amount of detail. So how do you make that decision? Well, there's three factors that I think are worth thinking about. Um, and, and you might think about these all together or, or in, in a particular order, but here they are. So one thing you might have an answer to immediately, or you might have to think about in consideration with the other questions is deciding how much time you can devote to, uh, to doing a survey. Uh, are you working to a particular deadline? Do you need to have an answer by a particular date in order to inform a, a meeting or fill in a funding application maybe? Or do you have to say to yourself, well, we can devote one member of staff for half a day a week on this survey, or one member of staff for three weeks, or one member of staff for six months, or something like this. Um, how, do you, how much time can you give to this survey, and when do you think you need an answer? So knowing that will help you cut your cloth, cloth to, fit the, uh, to fit the challenge, as it were. A second question is, um, take the quickest possible overview of your collection. Do you remember I mentioned when I looked around the enormous disc collection, um, the way I decided how much detail I was going to was by literally walking around the archive and, and taking a look at it and saying, okay, well, this is simple, but this is complicated. This is huge, and this is possible, and this is impossible. So I recommend you take a walk around wherever your collections are, if they're in one. So is it one interesting question is, are they all in one place or are they in multiple places? Do I know where they are? Do I need to do an appeal within my institution and say, if anybody has got a bunch of tapes or discs in their cupboards, can they please tell me about them? Are all the items visible in neat rows on shelves? And therefore, if they are, they're easy to count. You can just go along and go one, two, three, four, five. However, they may all be in boxes which need to be opened individually. And then sometimes you need to look inside those boxes and then pull the tapes out in order to count them. If that's the case, it'll take much, much longer to count them. And that needs to be borne in mind. Um, again, are they hidden in cupboards or are they on open shelves, uh, these boxes? Um, if they're hidden in multiple locations uh, in other departments or offices, um, one thing to bear in mind is that younger and newer members of staff are less aware of the whole concept of audio collections being on reels of tape or cassettes or mini discs. They tend not to think of audio in that way. They may not know what that stuff is in the cupboard. They may have opened a, a cupboard, said, what's in there? Bunch of boxes, pulled out the boxes and looked inside and found some unfamiliar weird stuff, which for all they know might be from a uh, a sound recording, a video recording, some computer data. They may have no idea. They may have quickly thought, well, I don't want anything to do with that and stuffed it back in the cupboard. That's a factor you may need to bear in mind. You may need to help people make sense of this stuff. You may need to go, go around to their office and take a look and say, well, it's this or it's that. Another useful question in your, in your kind of jogging around the, the, the shelves is, are they in good condition? Are they un in a uniform condition? Are they all in the same condition? Or are some in bad condition? Are they dusty? Do they seem to be degrading? Do they smell funny? Are they moldy? Uh, are there more or fewer sound formats than you thought you were going to find? Maybe you expected to find only cassettes, but they're actually their reel-to-reel tapes. Maybe there are LPs. Maybe there are other strange formats you haven't seen before. Uh, that's really worth knowing at the beginning because that will help you plan. 
does it all seem relevant to your institution? As I mentioned before, um, if you are uh, an archive of wildlife sound recordings, then uh, lots of music recordings will not be interesting to you or not really be part of the mandate of your institution. It may not be something that you need to care about too much. And so the third thing, once you've, um, once you've got a sense of that, you will, you will be able to, to say, OK, well, here's a draft of the questions I want to ask of this, things I want to note down in my, my spreadsheet, as it were. Um, uh, start uh, uh, with a basic level of detail, then choose a small subsection of the archive uh, and measure that according to the list you took and work out how long that took. Uh, and if you extrapolate from that out to the whole archive as far as you're aware of it, does it seem possible? If you think, well, I've only got two weeks to do the survey, you measure what looks like one tenth of the collection, um, and I work, and you you do that in ten percent of the time, like one day. Were you able to to write down that level of detail? If you were, then great. You'll probably be able to complete your survey at the level of detail you have sketched out in that time. If it took twice as long as you thought it would, then maybe you need to reduce the level of uh, detail you're gathering in, or maybe you need to argue for more time to carry out the survey. So all of these things need to be borne in mind when you are um, planning your survey. In general, it's perhaps better to gather in slightly too much detail than it is to gather in too little detail. Because it's easier to, to, to stop gathering in certain information, to just stop asking certain questions uh, when it is going around, than it is to go back to the beginning and start adding uh, columns to your spreadsheet. Uh, I think that's something that that you could probably work out for yourself. So how should you gather in the information? Um, one of the first thing you'll need to know is how to identify different sound formats. So let's talk about a couple of different tools that might be useful. Um, I think the first basic thing is what is this stuff? How do I identify one format from another? For some of you, this may be very obvious. For other people, it may be completely unfamiliar. So I want to introduce to you um, uh, a surveying tool. So I don't know if you can uh, use a, a mobile phone and uh, capture this QR code on your phone. That should open um, a link to, to the, the link you can see there. This takes you to a series of guides produced by the British Library about uh, caring for sound collections. The first one of these, you'll find a link to it on that, uh, within that page, is uh, called How to Identify and Care for the Sound Formats in Your Collection. It describes and gives pictures of different formats, and it also gives information that will be helpful in preservation planning. It will say, this format is a, a low, medium, or high priority for, for audio preservation. Uh, it's vulnerable in this way, but not in this way. You can identify it in this way, and so on. There's some other guides in here that you'll find that might be useful uh, about uh, digital storage, uh, uh, archival storage conditions on uh, uh, for physical collections, and so on. Um, within each guide, you'll find also some suggestions for further reading. So each guide is intended to be very brief. None of them are more than, I think, four or six pages. Um, but they give uh, authoritative links to, to other de materials that go into much, much deeper detail. So hopefully this can act as a, a gateway for you if you're just beginning uh, in your journey of preservation planning and, and strategic care of audio collections. Um, but that's one guide. And I hope you're able to, to uh, follow that link. Now, I, I can make these slides available if anybody's not able to follow them immediately. Another uh, useful thing is um, thinking about how you'll gather in the information. In my case, in the British Library's case, we found spreadsheets to be the simplest way of doing it. That way you can design uh, the spreadsheet as simply as you want. You can have uh, simply have columns for the different uh, uh, characteristics that you want to describe. Uh, other ways of doing it uh, can be more complex and more, uh, more practical for prioritizing. So uh, the Indiana University um, MDPI project 
Media Digital Preservation Initiative, I think it stood for, um, produced some wonderful tools for uh, working for, uh, for thinking about preservation and, and doing it in a strategic mass means. They produced two uh, online tools, one called Media Rivers and one called Media Score, uh, which if you follow this QR code, you can, you can download for free. Uh, and these are very useful for, um, uh, as I say, for prioritizing, for understanding the survey that you've created and for taking it to the next preservation or, or the next planning strategic level. It works particularly for research collections, so for recordable media, things like uh, instantaneous discs, cassettes, reel-to-reel -reel tapes, digital audio tapes, uh, video tapes. It doesn't cover things like LPs and commercial CDs but it is a, a very useful tool if you want to use it. I suggest you take a look at it and it might help your planning as you go along. Right, back to part two, conducting a regional or a national survey. So for this, um, similar principles are, apply to, um, to conducting a, a, a survey of other archives. Um, as to conducting a survey of your own archive in some ways. So uh, the more detailed information you gather, theoretically, the better that will be because it will um, give you more opportunities and ability to answer more questions, if you like. Um, but the more you ask for, um, the more effort will be required from the respondents, from the people you're asking. Uh, and the less likely people will be to respond to your questions. And I think that's a big challenge. But there's two big differences um, between carrying out a survey of your own and a survey of, uh, of other archives. First of all, the, the bridge rule that I mentioned earlier doesn't apply here. So if you're conducting a survey of a, of a geographical region or of a, of a, a country, a nation, um, or even internationally, um, it, you can never really consider it to be complete. It will only ever be a snapshot, um, but it will have to serve as, a, as a, a picture of what you have. So you can't ever say this is 100% complete. There will always be archives you know who have not fully responded. Also, um, in this situation, you are not responsible for gathering or, or for completing the data yourself. You're always relying on other people. Uh, doing that. And so your major challenge here may be persuading other people to take part at all in your survey. So, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. So formulating uh, the questions that you want to ask is, is a fundamental part of what you're doing here. And it's worth taking a moment to, uh, to think about this in detail. So what is it that you want to know? Um, what, what is the purpose for your survey? Why are you doing this? Uh, sometimes things you want to ask questions because they're interesting, because you're curious, but actually you need to drill more deeply into your own motives and ask why. Why am I asking these questions? Uh, and how will you use the information? What is the purpose of the survey? What will you do after the survey is complete? I think uh, at the time of asking of drafting your survey questions, it's really worthwhile drafting your strategy for what happens afterwards. After we have completed the survey, we will then be able to uh, dot, dot, dot. We will then be able to uh, address the national preservation crisis. We will then be able to ask for money to do something. We will then be able to create a national network of archives. We will then be able to understand what expertise there is in the region so that we can help each other or maybe we will be able to promote sound archives among the audiences maybe we'll be able to promote the value of sound archives we will help people uh, form a network all of these things that are possible answers to your questions but they will um form a they, they will help you structure what you're trying to do one of the, um, the big challenges that I mentioned was um, persuading people to complete a, a survey, to, to add something. I'm sure you receive emails like I do from discussion lists from time to time that say, 
I am carrying out a survey, please can you complete this? Now, be honest. When you see those emails, do you read through them and think, well, hmm, maybe I will take part in the survey? Or do you think, oh, it's a survey and I don't have time, I'm already too busy, and delete the email? If that's the case, how are you going to persuade other people to do something you're normally not willing to do yourself? You have to do some, make it really, really simple and really attractive to them. You have to make it clear to other people that it is in their interest to complete your survey. How are you going to do that? Well, um, to make it simple, um, I suggest you think about uh, minimizing the amount of time and expertise required of them to complete the survey. If you're asking questions that they don't understand the answers to, then you've got a real problem. Um, they may need help in identifying the formats. If you want to know how many items they have in different formats, help them identify the formats. And maybe this will be attractive to them that you're actually uh, helping them learn about their own collections. That can be very useful. So giving them things like the, the format ID guide I mentioned earlier might be helpful. Giving them very simple questions, um, giving them uh, drop down menus rather than you know multiple choice questions rather than ones that ex that require them to type out lots of information can be very helpful. One very useful way of doing that is to use an online form like a Google form, for example, if you've ever used those. Those are nice because you can fill them in very, very quickly. You just have to tick boxes very often. And also for the person receiving the information, it can be collated into a spreadsheet automatically. So that you can you can get the, you, uh, the, the information gathered in one place and you get the, the results of the total numbers, for example, or the percentages of archives that only have oral history, for example, or those kinds of questions. You can get answers to those very, very simply. And if you know that it only, if you do some tests and you work out, well, it only takes six minutes to complete our survey, then you can say that when you send the thing out and say, we're asking you to do this thing, but it will only take six minutes of your time. And then find ways of making it attract as attractive as possible. What is in it for the people answering the survey? If you can explain to the value of it, of completing it to them as well as to you, then that will help you a lot. Why will it be valued to them? Well, maybe um, you're inviting them to become part of a regional network or a national network. And how will that be? How will it be advantage advantageous for them to be, become part of that network? Well, maybe you will pool your expertise. Maybe you will be able to uh, share your expertise with them as part of this network. Maybe they have problems that you can help solve or other members of this network can help solve. Maybe it will increase their visibility within the community, either their user community or among their peers. Um, and that can always be attractive to people. Um, uh, everyone wants to be put on the map. Maybe you will literally create a map of audio archives and they will be on that. And everybody, um, if they know such a map will be created, they know that they need to be on it. They can't be left behind. So that can be really helpful to them. If you promise to share the results, then that can obviously be helpful. Um, and obviously, it means you have to do it. <laughs> you have to make the results uh, available. People are curious about the world that they are a part of. If they are a signed archive or if they hold a signed archive within them, they want to know about other people. Are they like other archives? Are they different? Are they ahead of the game or are they behind the game? Uh, these kinds of questions can be helpful to people. Also, um, uh, publicity is a really key thing. And sometimes this can make your archive more attractive uh, or make your, make your survey more attractive. And it's worth planning what your publicity campaign will be in advance. And your publicity campaign has two aspects. One is publicizing the survey you're doing so that people hear about it in a way that makes them want to complete it, but also publicizing the results of your survey. And that, again, can make it attractive to people. Now, there are uh, obvious discussion lists that you can share things with or, or announcement lists. The International Association of Sound Archives has a discussion list. The Association of Recorded Sound Collections has one. You may be specific ones around your the area you work in, the International Council for Traditional Music. 
uh, other ones around archives in general that are not specific to sound recordings. There may be ones about specific communities. And I think a key aspect will be reaching into specific communities. If you send a general email to a discussion list that says, we are doing a survey, please just think about joining the survey. And then um, that can be helpful. I'm hearing some sound. Is everything okay? Did someone open a microphone? Hopefully we're okay. Um, so uh, two stages to planning a, a publicity campaign. I would strongly suggest sending out where you have individual emails for individual people, I would strongly suggest sending out individual or individualized emails to those people rather than something on a discussion list. That way they'll feel uh, like you're communicating directly with them, they may feel um, a little bit more like they want to respond and help out. Uh, if that's possible, um, then that's a, a very, very useful thing. Um, so targeted emails and follow-up emails can be very, very helpful. Uh, think about reaching out into specific networks, not just uh, discussion lists and not just sound archives or, or not just memory institutions or heritage institutions, but also music societies might be good, local history groups if you can identify those, uh, industrial unions can be useful. There may be networks of enthusiasts for music or for other cultural things, plays, poetry, uh, bird watchers, wildlife enthusiasts, they can maintain networks and reach into those. Um, if you know of individual collectors, reach, uh, reach out to those. We found uh, there's an awful lot of railway enthusiasts. Fine. Hello? Lots of um, <laughs> railway enthusiasts love to make sound recordings, particularly from the 1950s, 60s and 70s. We have large collections of uh, of, of railway sounds, which are, are actually very interesting and, and very uh, of value in all kinds of interesting ways. So uh, I would suggest you, you sort of do some homework into reaching out into those communities, how you're going to do that. And then also think about how you're going to share um, the, the final uh, work in, it, in itself. And another really key thing is that anytime you get a, an answer or an email inquiry, please answer that email. Develop relationships with the people that you want to respond to this. It'll take quite a bit of work and quite a bit of attention and care. Uh, but I think it's worth doing uh, uh, because getting people to respond to your request for information will be your number one challenge. So let's talk a little bit about how the British Library did this. Uh, this link I'm sharing you now uh, takes you to a page with two documents. Uh, the page gives you a very brief account of the, uh, of the whole process of making the survey. There's a report, a detailed report on the process of making the survey, and that will give you lots of hints and lots of information about how the British Library did this. It's not necessarily um, the same as you would do it. You have your own specific circumstances, of course but it will give you some clues and some food for thought. It also gives a second link to uh, the actual survey results. Uh, and, and that's something that we sold very much to, no, we didn't physically sell for money, obviously, but we used it as an argument uh, or a, 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 an attractive feature for the people we wanted to complete the survey. We said, look, unless you want us to anonymize your results, which you might want us to, then we will publicize your archive. We will put you on the map. Uh, and this will act as a guide for any researcher who wants to find out about our archives or sound archives, uh, either about a particular topic or within a particular region. So let's take a look at the, uh, the kind of questions that we asked in our survey from the British Library. So we asked questions about the people who hold the collections, the collection holders. Um, and we asked them generally using drop down menus, but not always. So we made it as simple as possible. What type of collection holder are you? Now, that might mean uh, are you a, a heritage institution? Are you a museum or a gallery or an archive 
or a library, for example? Or um, are you a, a society or an association, or a trust, or a professional body of another type? Um, are you an individual, a private collector? This kind of information can be very useful. Second, what type of collection content do you have? What subjects do you collect? And again, we had uh, categories that people could, could choose from here. So it could be, uh, do you collect music? Is it classical music, popular music, traditional music? Do you collect language recordings or dialect recordings? Do you collect oral history material? Do you collect uh, drama or theater or literary recordings? Those kinds of things. Maybe you collect wildlife material or sound effects or field recordings. Uh, any kind of recordings that detail uh, landscape can be very, very useful, whether that be an urban landscape or a rural landscape, wildlife recordings. And these have values that, that um, uh, particular types of research researchers use in ways that were not ever envisaged at the time. So simple recordings of street sounds can be incredibly valuable if you want to understand uh, how noise pollution has changed throughout history. And there are researchers who, who use that kind of material quite a lot now. Uh, we ask people for their address and their contact details, but um, it's very important to remember GDPR. You need to ask people for their permission uh, to retain their information, their personal information, or their or to share their personal in their information if you're if you're collecting it, such as email addresses and so on. Um, so so build that into your survey. Ask asking for their permission. They may say yes, I want to give you information about my collection, but I do not want you to publish my email address, for example. That kind of thing can be useful. If they have a website, we ask them for the website so that we could share that ourselves. And, and again, that's good publicity for them uh, and, and quite useful. After that, we ask them about their um, the collections that they hold. And many respondents said that they held more than one collection. So it wasn't simply a, a single institutional collection. In some cases, it could be, uh, for example, a museum uh, may have multiple collections or a uh, a university of multiple departments, for example. So we asked them for the title of that collection, if it had one. Again, we asked them for the subjects, you know, what type of material that were within that collection. Then we asked them for a, a collection description. And this was not a drop down menu. This was a free text box where it allowed them to put a paragraph or two about what the collection was. Sometimes this was just something they lifted from their own web page. It could be something that said something about the provenance of the collection, where it came from, when the collection began, when it ended, perhaps it's a finite collection, um, something about the biography of the collector or of the, of the material. So something that, that humanized it a little bit, if you like. Uh, if the collection had an online catalog, and if it did, we could present a link to that. And again, that was good free publicity for them. Uh, we asked them for basic information about the formats they held and the numbers. And this, uh, for a lot of people, is the very is the most basic information they might want. Um, but it may not be. Uh, it may not be something that's important to you. Uh, but in our case, we wanted to know something about that. And again, that's quite a challenge to ask them that if they have never done that kind of thing themselves. So we had to help them in every way we possibly could in uh, simplifying that task for them. And we asked them whether they had digitized any of the collection. Whether, uh, whether digital copies exist. Uh, and they could say, yes, we have, or no, we don't, or partially, we have, we've digitized part of our collection. Now, the way we asked this, co this collection, this question wasn't actually the best way we said to them, do digital copies exist? But actually that's not a very useful question from a digital preservation point of view, because they may have digital copies in, uh, in obsolete digital format. So these things may be held on CDR or digital audio tape, uh, which, so the answer is yes, we do have digital copies, but actually th those are not what we would consider to be um, uh, digitally archived in a modern sense. CDRs and uh, digital audio tapes are high, high risk items from an archive point of view. They're, they're high priority from a preservation requirement. So, that does not 
having something on a CDR is not the end of a, a digital preservation journey, it's really just the beginning of one. So I wish we had worded that question in a different way. Unfortunately, um, we didn't. And then we made, as uh, I mentioned, we made the full results available online uh, to the degree that people were willing to do that. So what were the, the, the basic results to our survey? We had 488 uh, responses to our survey, so that's not bad. Um, we know there are many, many more institutions did not respond to our survey, and that's a big shame that they didn't. Any large ones who uh, who we wanted to respond to, we made a point of um, of gently reminding them to serve, to complete it, of, of contact them and ask them how we could help them complete it. So we got as much information as we could. Those 488 responses um, described uh, 3,015 collections. And within those 3,015 collections, there were uh, 1,870,496 ,000, physical items. So that's more than the British Library collection I mentioned earlier. That's a, that's quite a, a, a huge amount of stuff within the collection there. So, okay, we've done our survey, but um, in what way was the survey useful? How did we use this? And of course, this is the question we asked ourselves at the very beginning. Why are we doing this? What's the point of this? Um, well, it helped us to, uh, to define and demonstrate that there was a, a, a national problem within the UK. Uh, the British Library has, uh, has a degree of responsibility in the UK to lead in the preservation and the care of audio collections. So this was... Um, in order to do that, you need to know what the scale of the problem is, and you need to be able to demonstrate it to provide evidence that there is a, a, a challenge. And then it helps us to, to define a proposed solution to, um, to this uh, preservation problem that we, we discovered. And what we did was uh, propose uh, a five-year project uh, that would digitize both collections in the British Library and around the UK. Now we recognised from this survey that the problem wasn't just that people had uh, sound materials, 1.8 sound, 1.8 million sound items that needed digital preservation, but there was a, a lack of skills, a lack of expertise to do that, a lack of equipment, and a lack of resource in general to do that. So we needed to increase the amount of expertise. Uh, and increase the resource available to do that. So we proposed to the National Lottery Heritage Fund in the UK, who fund heritage projects. Um, we proposed a five-year project um, where we would digitize material at the British Library, but we would also create 10 digitization centers of excellence, as we called them, around the UK. We create a national preservation network um, so we create one digitization center in Scotland, one in Wales, one in Northern Ireland, and seven around England. So 10 in total. And we would equip them. We would buy them uh, equipment. We would help them set up a studio. We would train people in those institutions uh, to digitize material, to catalog it, uh, and to clear the rights for that material. So this was quite a large undertaking. Uh, uh, the project was successful. We were given funding by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The project began in 2017. We were funded, including the, the money put in by the institutions themselves. The project was funded to the, to the tune of 21, uh, sorry, 21 million euros or 18.8 .8, million pounds in the UK. So it was a very uh, ambitious project. Uh, completing that is it's now largely complete. Uh, it, it completed, officially ended in, in 2022. Uh, there was a, a small extension to until uh, March this year, so it's just now winding down at the British Library. The website is now live. I'm afraid I didn't put a link in here, but it's sounds.bl.uk will take you to the website that was created as part of this project. Because the fund is required not simply that we digitize it but that we clear the rights so that we can make it available and put it online. And that's largely what we've done. It's still a work in progress. Material is being put online, 
Not everything that we digitize could be put online because there are copyrights that could not be cleared and sensitivities that could not be overcome and so on, but that's okay. Um, not every sound recording needs to be online, but it does need to be preserved. So that was um, the, the, the challenge we set ourselves, and that was the reason we created this survey. Uh, the, as you'll see, if you look at those uh, documents I shared the links to earlier, um, the, 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 the survey was, uh, was quite detailed in its results and the analysis of it was quite detailed. And that was what gave us uh, the, the impetus to do the work that we did. So um, I'll just share now a, a link to another useful project that I think is also worth looking at both um, as an example of, uh, both for the details that they discovered and, but also for the way that they went about it and the way that they promoted it. This was the, what was called the Magnetic Tape Alert Project. This was funded by uh, the Information for All program of UNESCO and assisted by the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, IASA. Uh, and this was an international survey of magnetic tape. Magnetic tape, analog magnetic tape in particular is uh, highly at risk because nobody makes tape machines around the, the, the world anymore. Um, it's very hard to find spare parts for them. And it's very hard to find the expertise to maintain these. Now, this is difficult enough in Western Europe, Eastern Europe, um, North America, but it's extremely hard uh, in other parts of the world, uh, around Africa, parts of Asia, and so on. Uh, every country's heritage is of equal value to every other country's heritage. And therefore, uh, it was important that the risk to the global risk and how that uh, risk is, is distributed around the UK be measured uh, and understood so that the challenge could be uh, targeted. So that was the purpose of this survey. It was uh, so highly political in nature. So I, I strongly recommend you take a look at this uh, as another example. So that takes us to the end of the slides I have. Um, we've ended slightly earlier than I planned to, but I really hope you all have some questions. <laughs>